Welcome to the Consulting Success Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Zapersky. In this podcast, we'll dive deep into the world of elite consultants, where you'll learn the strategies, tactics, and mindset to grow a highly profitable and successful consulting business. Hey, it's Michael Zapersky, and today I'm very excited to have Aaron Hersey joining us. Aaron, welcome. Hi, Michael. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, this is going to be fun. So let's kind of get things moving right away because one thing that intrigued me as soon as I came across your profile was you're a consultant, but your title says anthropologist. Tell us more about what that means and what you really do. Yeah, absolutely. So my title says workplace anthropologist and as well as lead inventor, because that's my title here at What If. The workplace anthropology part is really about you know, I think when people think of innovation, they're often looking externally at products and services. But there's so much innovation that can happen within companies. And to take a human-centered lens with that means to really understand what's happening within organizations today with a lens not necessarily of either it's right or it's wrong or it needs to be fixed or better, but just the starting point of empathy of what's happening today and maybe a bit of why. And from that, that's actually what the anthropology part is. So I actually go into organizations and help companies understand their employees. Oftentimes, we create systems that we think have one outcome, but they can often have another or implications that we hadn't seen. And so we sort of, in some ways, like pour ink over the invisible parts of your business to help you see them. So that's really the anthropology part. And the outcome of my work is often what we call organizational insights, the same as what you would have with consumer insights, but these ones tend to be more focused on your people, your organizations, and the systems and structures that underpin it. So do you consider yourself to be an innovation consultant or what would you kind of most maybe closely associate maybe what other people would call a more typical term as opposed to anthropologist? How do you see yourself as an innovation consultant or something a little bit different? Yeah, I mean, I definitely see myself as an innovation consultant, but it's one of those funny things that when you say you work on innovation, it doesn't really tell anyone what you do. Mm, Right. (laughs) I find the workplace anthropologist piece of it sort of starts to give you more of a sense of the type of innovation that I'm focused on. So I my the innovations that I work with companies on tend to be within their own system. So looking at new ways, innovative ways of doing talent programs, whether it's developing your talent, sourcing new talent, innovative ways of looking at your space. So how we how the human element interacts in the space and how that impacts the experience of your employees. Also looking at the difference between flexible working and mobile working, which are actually very different things. And really trying to understand in I think in its most idealized version, you know, what brings joy to your employees because realizing that it's the people within a business that make the business run and make the business grow. Got it. Unlocking them is really my key, whether it be individuals, teams, or executives. How do you go about doing that? Because another paragraph on your bio that caught my attention, as I said, working with people and teams to help them identify their innate capabilities and existing resources and better understand the large business realities than applying this information to crack any challenge they might face. So. Yeah. That to me could be very broad, right? Like there's a lot of challenges that companies could face, but how do you actually go about doing what you just shared that you do? I mean, take us through an example of maybe a project or details of how you do your work. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of the way that I approach my work comes from the fact that back in the day, I worked in international development. And what I learned from international development is that when we have challenges, we often focus on our needs and the things that we don't have. And when you start with that lens, it can be really difficult to solve problems. Mm. And so it's actually better to start with looking at what you do have. From international development, that's called asset-based community development. So stealing from that line of work that I previously did and taking the principles of that work and applying it within my work today is really how I start to look at organizations. So while we might frame up a challenge, and we're, there's a lot of work that we do to make sure that we're framing up the right challenge, we also start by sort of understanding, what is your ambition around where you want to go? Why is this the challenge that you've chosen? And framing up what that ambition and end state is, and then painting a really clear picture of where we are today. And part of that is both understanding the motivations of your people, There's lots of different ways that we go to gather those insights. 
I've actually gone into people's homes with them, met them at their homes at 7 a.m., shadowed them through their day until 11, met their families and started to see them as more of a whole person and really understand their context. But then we also do what we call mobile missions, where we use digital platforms that are apps that can live on people's phones. And we give them challenges relevant to that challenge. So if it's a productivity challenge that we might be working on, or one about one of my favorite questions that we got asked was, how can we bring joy to our people's lives? Then what we do is we have them capture moments in their day of things that are either inhibiting their productivity or boosting their productivity, or we have them capture things that are bringing joy to their life or detracting. And the reason why that's so powerful is in conversation with people, you only think of so many things. And it's those little nuanced moments that we find really unlock the insights that unlock challenges. Mm. So by being able to use the technology part of me, speaking of technology, to live in that pocket, yeah. we're able to capture moments that wouldn't necessarily rise to the surface otherwise. And it gives us a different view in. And that kind of becomes my data set. And from that data set, we can look across all of the different moments that they submit and we have them tell me like how either much of a blocker it is or how much of a booster it is and what's the why behind it. And then I can start to synthesize insights from that. When you combine that with the work of actually shadowing them and really living in the context with them for a bit and getting to know their whole lives, you can start to see implications beyond just the in the office experience, which we think is really important because I really look at things as a work-life integration, not a work-life balance. Mm -hmm. If something happens in my personal life, it definitely comes to work with me. And I can definitely tell you that when I have a project, I take it home and I'm thinking about it at home too. So it's that integration place that we want to make sure we assess as well. So that's sort of the starter how. And then for the assets piece, as we're doing that work and as we uncover different assets, and I look at that as whether that's your tangible and intangible assets, whether that's your network, tools that you use, models and ways of thinking, spaces that you have, We start to map those out so that as we think about the challenge, we're actually leveraging what you have and focusing on how we can use what you have to solve the problem versus focusing on what you don't have. Mm. And so that's just a framework that I like to use to start to solve those challenges. Yeah, I really like that. What you just mentioned, we recently posted on Consulting Success, our 10 guiding principles, kind of the 10 things that we really believe and follow that make our business successful and our lives successful. And one of those really connects to what you just said, which is less is more. And from like a marketing perspective and a business perspective, I think you're exactly right. A lot of people tend to default when they're encountering a challenge or they want to see greater results. The first thing that they ask themselves is like, what else can I do? Right? What else can I add? But what you just shared, I'm a very big believer in as well, is before going off and just trying to add something new or to do something different, maybe you already have the answer and solution to what you're looking for contained within your assets or your business or yourself right now and really looking for ways to strengthen or improve what already exists before having to go and do something completely different. From a marketing perspective, it would be, okay, we want more clients. Well, the first thing that a lot of people default to is maybe we should go do some advertising. But what if you already have more clients sitting within your existing clients or within your referral base or things of that nature that you haven't even tapped yet? So I think that's a really powerful principle. And I like how you've apply that to the work that you're doing. Oh, I love that. And I would say, as you look at getting more clients, oftentimes, the best way to find new clients is actually to be introduced from people that you already know. Mm -hmm. People don't know how to introduce you. And so if you think about your network as your intangible asset, then you can start to say, what are the ways that I can activate that network? And then you can think about, well, what do I have? And so by thinking, it's almost an expansive moment. So first, we think about mapping expansively what the assets we have are. This is one of my... If you can actually map them out into something... For me, I'm very visual. So it helps me to have a visual map of them. I actually have like a little landscape map of my assets. It helps me be more creative because then I can go back to it and say, okay, what maps to this challenge? What can I leverage? And how might I be thinking about those assets in a way that's locking them away and their potential away because of the way I've framed them up? And so sometimes what we actually do for different challenges is we'll take that asset map and we'll start to collide the assets and start to think about what if I put this with this and how might that help me solve this problem in a new way? 
And part of that also means backing away from your assets once you've mapped them to think about what's the real purpose of them. Oftentimes to the siloed point, we have a, maybe it's a digital tool that we're using within our company and we think of it in one way of use. But if you can back up and sort of say, what's really the purpose of it? And then you might be able to see how you could use that exact same technology somewhere else and not have to go buy something new or not have to reach out for something because you've probably already got it. Right. So we're talking about getting clients. And I know that you've worked with some very well-known, well-established brands and organizations. What have you found to be the most effective approach to getting new clients to winning appointments with people where you have then the opportunity to engage in a conversation with them? Yeah. So it's so funny. I think everyone has a different way of showing up that works best for them. When I sit back and think about who I am, like I'm absolutely extroverted. I love to chat and think. For me, it's about... One, I meet people through the different kinds of events that I put myself in. Every year, I go to a select number of conferences. And I've chosen them because they're the events where you can actually have conversations where the people on the stage are as interesting as the people who are in the audience. So... That's one place. I, there's a few conferences that I always go to. Pop Tech is definitely one of my favorites. A few others that rise up. Dent is a really interesting one. But I look for ones where I'm actually going to be able to have real conversations with people. And it's not because I know that there's a selling opportunity. Oftentimes, these tend to be a bit more long tail. Mm-hmm. But at any of the events that I go to, when I meet people, I'm always focused on how can I add value to them. And that sometimes that's an introduction to someone else. Sometimes it's not actually working with me. But I feel like when I engage with people and we start to have conversations, I'm always thinking about what's the value I can add to them versus what's the value I can extract. Are you able to attribute a direct ROI from the events that you go to? Yeah. I mean, if I look at clients that I've engaged after these events, absolutely. I think that's so important because a lot of people go to events with the idea of they're going to go learn something. And learning and self-development, professional development is very important. But I've also observed that going to events and having a focus of meeting other people who can be prospective clients, exactly how you said it, right? You know, depositing value into that relationship bank is really, really powerful if you put in the work to actually attend them and go to network and not just to sit and intake information or to go to the bar and have a drink. Yeah. And the thing I'd say is that actually for that inputting value, I think oftentimes we're looking for the client. And if I look at the ROI on those conferences, my biggest relationships have come from have actually come from introductions. So it's not that I necessarily meet the immediate person. I think too often, we're looking at conference badges and we're looking at what's your name and where are you? And while I think it's important to sort of have a line of sight into who you want to meet at these conferences, it's also really important to be open to realizing that the people you talk to have their own networks. And if you make an impression with them, and if they really understand what the value is that you add, they're going to introduce you as well. Do you find that you typically will ask the people that you know to make an introduction, say, hey, you know, I'd love to connect with anyone that meets this kind of criteria? Or is it just naturally the people that you know are making those introductions for you without you even asking? While we work with a lot of seasoned and experienced consultants here at Consulting Success, I'm often contacted by new early stage consultants. Invariably, the question I'm asked is, what are the steps I should take to become a successful consultant and grow my consulting business to my first six figures per year? Well, I'm excited to announce that we've opened the doors for our Momentum program. This is our most popular program for early stage consultants, and it has helped almost 1,000 consultants to start, run, and grow successful consulting businesses. It gives you the step-by-step plan to help you with your messaging, your fees, and pricing strategies, how to win more proposals, how to go to market more effectively, developing a marketing system to generate leads consistently, and so much more. And right now, until September the 19th, you can sign up for Momentum and get 50% off the regular price by going to consultingsuccess.com forward slash audio. That's consultingsuccess.com forward slash audio, A-U-D-I-O. Only 100 spots are available to join Momentum and get 50% off. This deal is only available until September the 19th or until all 100 spots are gone. We won't be opening up new spots in this program for several months. So don't wait. Go to consultingsuccess.com forward slash audio. That's consultingsuccess.com forward slash audio. A-U-D-I-O. Well, it's 
it's both. I'd love to think that it was just naturally happening, but it's definitely both. When I think about the conversations that I have with them, we often start the conversation off by sort of understanding like, what are you interested in right now is one of my favorite questions to ask people. Because one, it's a question they're excited to answer. And two, because it lets them speak from their own place of knowledge. Mm-hmm. It allows you to kind of quickly think, what else in my world is tied to that? So it gives you a broader place to talk from. And then within that, I can normally position what I find interesting about what I do. It gives me a way to make what I do relevant to them and their interests. And so within that, I'm giving them kind of enough data about me for them to be able to make connections. Now, there might be in talking to people, I always, after conferences, follow up LinkedIn people. I quickly look at who do they know who I might want to know. Mm-hmm. And if there's any, and I always make sure I do my end of the thought. If I ever think that I'm going to introduce someone or if I'm going to connect them with a piece of information, I make sure that that happens. And I use that as part of my follow up because I want to make sure one, I'm providing value before I'm extracting it. And so if they do have connections that I'd love to meet, I'm also very clear about why I want to talk to that person. And I make that introduction for them as easy as possible, which is often saying, here's what I think is interesting. Here's why I'd love to talk to them. Would you mind connecting me? And then I even will go as far as to give them a piece of introductory text if it's helpful. Nice. What other tactics or actions have you found that work well for you and your company to win business and to generate leads? You know, as I think about what has been helping us win pitches lately, I really think that making it real for people about what you're going to do, giving them some starter ideas and provocations, it's better than just talking process to people. I think everyone has a process. And while it's important for people to understand how you'll work together, it's not really the most inspiring part of the work that we're doing. So framing up the interesting provocations that you could solve together, giving them some idea of some forces that might be impacting their business today internally, and how they might be able to change. I think sort of setting that bit of inspiration at the front is really useful. And it helps set you apart because it shows that you're not just thinking about following a process and being a slave to the process. You're focused on that end goal. And I know that for the work that I'm doing, what if that is absolutely part and parcel of what we do? The impact of the work is really the core of what we do and what we're focused on. So that really helps as far as, I would say, winning the work and making it real. So wherever you can bring realness to it to give them an idea of what it might feel like, look like, that's super helpful. Good. And how about outbound? Any other strategies or tactics that you found to be effective in generating those leads? So just even having the opportunity to get in front of someone and have a conversation, what's working well for you? Yeah. So I would say there's for me personally, and then there's for what if as an organization, I think for what if as an organization, our, we've been using a chatbot, which has actually been really helpful to allow people to connect with you on their own time. And then I would say for other outbound, it's making sure that you're present in different places. My work doesn't span one industry. It really goes across sector. And so making sure that I'm going to different kinds of events. One of the things that I definitely am working on getting better at is in general, my writing and making sure that it's not just showing up in the typical places where you might expect to find it, that it's actually reaching new audiences. One of the great things I think you can do is if you have content that you can share that's really interesting. I often am not just sharing even just my content. I'm doing a lot of research and reading. And so what I think about is, you know, who have I connected to who this would be interesting to? Mm-hmm. So I have a running list of people who I'm just pinging every once in a while, not for an ask, but actually to provide value, just to check up, check in. And I find that most of my information comes from is a combination. It's just following up. It sounds so obvious, but it's actually rather time consuming. And so getting a system around it that works for you is really important. Yeah. Follow-up is so important. You're right. Aaron, when you're working on a client project and run into, let's say, a client that isn't cooperative or that you feel is just kind of draining your energy and things aren't going smooth, what is the first thing that you do? How do you handle those situations? I'm sure that we've all encountered them. Yeah, I was going to be like, that's never happened. But I think (laughs) we all know that's not true. You know, a big part of the way that we work at What If, that I think is really important is that we always work in pairs. And actually, we we really believe in the brain trust. So I think 
whether you're in an agency or whether you are solo, making sure that you have people that you can reach out to, to think about new ways in, to give you a bit of inspiration on how you might deal with the situation is really important. For me, I always try and sit back and think about what is the underlying emotion that's driving this person? What's there beyond their motivation? Like, is it a bit of, you know, they have a lot on their plate and so they're worried about being the bottleneck and so they're pushing or it's a lot of pressure for them and there's fear that's really driving some of their reactions. And so trying to sort of understand what those things are, if you haven't done a good job of it at the beginning of the project, making sure that you take a pause moment and just to check in. And making that check in a bit more personal, I find really helps. Otherwise, if you are able to work more on a team, even sometimes just changing the person, you're still involved but making sure maybe the next time it's a different person on your team who's talking. Just to see if you can change the dynamic, I find really helpful. For me personally, when that happens, I like to just have my own little... I give myself a 20 minutes of venting a week where I'm allowed to be negative and that's it. And I put it all in that 20 minutes. And my goal is always to sort of see it, focus on it, let it go. Good tips. When you look around you, because I'm you've worked as a consultant and played several roles, I'm sure you've encountered and worked with many other consultants as you've risen up in your career. What is one of the biggest mistakes that you've seen consultants make that you feel holding back? Maybe it's something that you experienced yourself as well, or just something that you know that if people corrected, they would be much more successful? Oh, that's a great question. You know, there's a few things. I think when it comes to sort of organizational change and making organizations more responsive and adaptive, it's wanting to go for perfect at the gate and not doing anything until it is perfect. Mm. So much of the work that we do is about experimentation, is about rapid prototype, and is about trial. And I think those principles seem like they make a lot of sense in the consumer world and have really taken on from products. But we don't think about how we might do that from the more internal colleague lens. So before we create these talent programs, and there's always a desire to move fast and get it to scale quickly, I think there's a need to say, let's make sure we try this out so we really understand everything that's happening within it. What are our most critical assumptions? Let's identify those and make sure that we solve for them. In the work that we do, oftentimes we talk about failure versus learning, but really I think it comes down to just being open to iterate. And so much of that means making sure that you make it real. So the more you can make it real, the more often, whether it's moving from paper prototypes and really putting down how something might work to trying it out with a smaller group before you go and just launch the whole thing at scale, that's really... Those are the biggest mistakes that I see because they're the hardest ones to then pull back from because you've used a lot of your clout within an organization. So what do you say to the consultant listening to this that agrees with you? They understand conceptually or instinctively that they should not wait for things to be perfected, that they probably tend to be perfectionists a little bit too often, yet they look at an opportunity to, let's say, reach out to an ideal client or to put something out there into the marketplace. And they feel concerned. They hold back taking that action because they see it as they have one chance and they have one chance to make a good impression. What has been your experience and your perspective on that? And how would you counsel them in regards to that? Yeah, I mean, there's always ways when we start to get started to think about how you can do something small to take some of the risk out of it. So I would always say, if you're worried about putting something out there, where is that worry coming from? And let's outline what those assumptions are and figure out how we can learn quickly. If it's a time-based situation and if it's about making an impression, that's more personal rather than like project-based, I'd say. And so I would say, start with an open and honest conversation. I think the more that we can operate in transparency, be about this is what I'm excited about and this is why. And I'm actually looking to build this with you. And making it feel more like partnership has been where I've found the most amount of success. Because as a consultant, your job really is to be a partner. I think we often talk about our clients as partners, but really, we're the partner. We're the one who's coming in to help them do something where ultimately, yes, we have responsibility because of our organizations and our own budgets, but we're also impacting their jobs. And so we have to remember that the more that you can start to be transparent and find the moments to sort of build more transparency in a more transparent way, I find it really helps. Whether that's 
finding the right level of bringing them into the sausage making so that they can see how things are growing and changing and they can give their feedback early and often, bringing their perspective and their own, you know, they're really experts in their own business to what you're doing, the better. So I think whether it's from a personal level or whether it's from a project level, finding that level of transparency that allows someone to build on your thinking, it creates that partnership that I think really makes successful relationships and successful projects. Aaron, you've talked quite a bit about providing value to prospective client and buyer, thinking of ways to show them a more tangible, just going beyond like methodology and process and really giving them some insight into what it really will look like to work together and what you might tackle. How do you deal with organizations or prospective clients who want to get your expertise, your knowledge, your skills applied to their situation, but may just be really tire kicking? They want to get your perspective on something and you want to provide them with a lot of value in response to that. But how do do you personally or your company, how do you ensure that people are actually qualified so that you don't spend too much time giving out just information and your expertise and your knowledge if someone truly isn't an ideal client? Yeah, this is a really tough challenge. I think the part of the pitching process is making sure that you're not just pitching yourself, but that you're also vetting the relationship to make sure it's a good fit. And oftentimes, that's definitely hard to figure out. We often look at that as making sure that as we're pitching and as we're beginning projects, that we always start with a series of questions that really help us make sure that we have the right understanding of what's happening and what the end goal is. Making sure that our end goals are actually aligned. And then what we're saying is the goal really is the goal. And some of that is sometimes talking with them to make sure that you understand whether it's their risk really take on and transform really quickly or go after a disruptive solution. But if you're not willing to take the risk that goes along with that, then it's not really right there's a dissonance that you need to be able to either close or address because it can cause a lot of problems in the project later on. And that's just through conversation. I think making sure that you ask those questions Mm -hmm. at the beginning. I really fully believe in the idea of best questions, not best practices. And that's because practices are context specific. But questions are really the thing that we're answering based on the context that gets us to the answer. And so I think as we step back and start to think about what are the right questions to ask at different parts of any journey with a client, capturing those, and they'll be different depending on what your industry is or what your challenge is, those become the cornerstone of the ways of working that help us make sure that we set up good relationships with clients at the outset. That's a terrific insight. Aaron, I really want to thank you for coming on here and sharing with us today and with all the audience. Before we end here, I want to make sure that people can learn more about you and your work. What is the best place for them to go to? Yeah, I would say if you want to learn more about me, my LinkedIn is public and out there. And then if you want to learn more about what if, whatifinnovation.com. It's a long website address, but it's a really lovely company. So definitely check that out. I post on Medium occasionally if you want to find my posts there. All right. We'll make sure to have all those linked up in the show notes. You can find the full transcript on consultingsuccess.com. Just go there and search for Aaron's podcast and you'll get everything. Aaron, again, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. This has been really fun. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Consulting Success Podcast. For more episodes and to subscribe, rate, and leave a review, head on over to iTunes. And if you'd like to develop consistent lead flow and a highly profitable consulting business, learn more about our coaching programs at consultingsuccess.com. 